Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is Peter Reynolds, leader of the UK political party CLEAR, a single issue party that seeks an end to the prohibition of cannabis. Their other key objectives include promoting as a matter of urgency and compassion the prescription of medicinal cannabis by doctors, introducing a system of regulation for the production and supply of cannabis based on facts and evidence, educating and informing about the uses and benefits of cannabis, and encouraging the production and use of industrial hemp. Whether you are a cannabis user or not, the fact that a plant which grows naturally in many parts of the earth should be subject to such draconian laws should be cause for curiosity and concern, as the situation says a great deal about freedom or lack thereof in many of our societies. Hello and welcome, Peter Reynolds, and thank you very much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Thank you, Greg. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, we're here today to discuss um, the issue of cannabis prohibition, uh, as it is in the UK and in many other parts of the world as well. Um, before we get into the main topic, perhaps you could just give us a bit about your background and uh, the political party, Clear, and um, how you come to get involved with this work. Okay. Uh, I'm a writer by trade. I was uh, in the advertising business for uh, many years um, through the heyday of advertising in, in the 1980s. Um, but I've been a cannabis user for even longer. Um, I started using cannabis when I was 14. I'm, I was 55 last week. So I've been using it for quite a while. Um, and I was always pretty outraged at the way that the law tried to interfere with what I saw as my personal liberty. Um, and I did a bit of writing to newspapers and etc. in my younger days. And in fact, probably the, the, the most important thing I did was I there was a home affairs uh, committee inquiry in, into cannabis back in 1983. And I actually wrote a document and, and submitted it to them back then. Um, but sort of coming roughly quickly up to date or coming up to about five or ten years ago, um, I began to read more and more about the evidence that was coming out about the medicinal use of cannabis. And whereas there had always been this sort of, um, shall we say, hippie idea that uh, cannabis was medicine and it could help you with stuff, sudden, well not suddenly, but there was more and more scientific evidence was coming out showing the, the, the real benefits of cannabis. Um, and really, this goes way beyond an issue of my personal liberty. Uh, and when, as coming right up to date now, when as you, you, I have now seen and met personally many people who use cannabis medicinally, and I see the way that it absolutely transforms their life, well, this really ignited my passion. And I, I began to write more and more about it on my blog. And eventually, uh, some people approached me, said, you know, the legalized cannabis campaign in this country is, is in the doldrums. It needs, uh, it needs leadership. Um, and cut a very long story short, uh, I found myself on the committee of the Legalized Cannabis Alliance. Um, I then found myself elected as leader. Uh, and I then took it upon myself using my skills in advertising and marketing uh, to rebrand us as Cannabis Law Reform Clear um, and uh, launch a new website um, and uh, re-register as a political party and, and that's where we are today. Well a lot of um, uh, people who perhaps get their information about uh, cannabis and other sort of uh, substances shall we say through the mainstream media uh, we'll hear a lot about police raids and about uh, damage to children and about, uh, you know, money laundering cannabis farms. And they may be aware of uh, some of the ways that cannabis can be processed into various forms. And all of this obscures the central fact that what we're talking about here is basically a bit of mother nature. Something actually is naturally occurring on this planet. It's just a leafy plant that grows, not in all areas of the world, but it just grows left to its own, you know, uh, business and that it is a multi-purpose plant uh, all sorts of applications for it and uh, that it's actually been used uh, for lots of these different applications by uh, humankind for millennia 5,000 years at least I mean I think the the oldest recorded 
archaeological discovery was in a tomb in Central Asia, it, which dates back to 2700 BC, uh, and that was psychoactive cannabis. I mean, I mean, as, as you correctly say, uh, the cannabis plant is also known as the hemp plant. Um, the only difference uh, between cannabis and hemp is, is really a modern definition, and that is the industrial hemp is uh, specified as being cannabis that has a THC content of less than 0.2%. Well, let's cut to the chase here. And uh, first of all, that cannabis has not always been illegal. How could it have been? And it isn't illegal everywhere in the world. But as far as the mainstream uh, explanation for this is concerned, why is it illegal in the first place? What's being said? Why are we know if we go and ask and walk up to our local police station and say, why can't I do this? What are they going to tell us? And what do you think are the the actual motivations for it being prohibited? Well, the, what what the, your local police station would tell you, or what the the Home Office or the Department of Health would tell you, is they'd tell you cannabis is illegal because it's harmful. Um, but that has absolutely nothing to do with the reason why it was made illegal in the first place. Um, and in fact, it's got nothing to do with the reason why it remains illegal, because it you know compared to uh, the two most popular. Uh, recreational drugs, alcohol and tobacco, uh, cannabis is, is hundreds of times less harmful. Um, but, the, but the reason cannabis was made illegal in the, or prohibited in the first place, because we have to, I mean, you may think I'm being pedantic with this, but I mean, it, it's actually incorrect to say that cannabis is illegal. Um, it's the possession, cultivation, supply or importation of cannabis that's illegal. So I think it's an important distinction to recognize that, you know, you can't really make a plant illegal. No, no, what, fair enough. What, it's good to clarify that. What, 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 what the law does is it makes people's actions with the plants illegal. So it's people that are being controlled, not mm-hmm. the plant. Um, so the reason, that can, the, the reason that cannabis was first prohibited in Europe um, goes back to the League of Nations, which was the forerunner to the United Nations. Um, and it goes back to a, a convention that I believe was drawn up in 1925, the, the Opium Convention, I believe. Um, and cannabis was included in this uh, at the last minute based on a request by the Egyptian government. And if you go back and look at the records of this, there was no debate or discussion about it. The Egyptian government came up with the idea that it wanted to include cannabis, principally because it had been lobbied by Egyptian cotton farmers. Now, you know, hemp is an alternative to cotton. Hemp is, in fact, a much better fibre for making fabric than cotton is. It's much stronger. It's much warmer. Um, it requires less processing, uh, it produces less pollution, um, and it, it, back in, in, in those days there was some significant competition between hemp farmers and cotton farmers. And the cotton farmers of Egypt managed to get cannabis included in this convention, and that was how cannabis first became prohibited in Europe. Slightly different in America. Um, in America, it, 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 it uh, came about because of, um, really, because of the end of alcohol prohibition. Uh, and al- the alcohol prohibition, which I believe ended in '33, um, had built up an enormous infrastructure of people and, and, and organizations, um, and suddenly they were all out of a job. Uh, in particular, a, a gentleman called Harry Anslinger. Um, who, having been head of the Alcohol Prohibition Board, got a new job as head of the Narcotics Board and decided he was going to crack down on what they call marijuana in the States. Marijuana was a term deliberately chosen to demonize the plants because it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a Mexican word and it was chosen to be used in a sort of racist way that, you know, Hispanic and and black men were going to corrupt and, 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 and molest white girls um, uh, who would give up their virtue immediately as soon as they got a whiff of a marijuana cigarette. Um, so, so, so that was so, so slightly different reasons in, 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 in the US and Europe. But I mean, fundamentally, it's got nothing to do with the, um, the harmfulness of the plants. It's to do with vested interests. Um, and with political corruption. Now, it's interesting you say that it left behind that in America, that uh, uh, the end of alcohol prohibition left behind the structure um, of officialdom and basically you know, people wanting to tell other people what to do. But it also, I suppose, uh, left behind a criminal infrastructure as well. You know, the bootleggers 
So, and a lot of, you know, criminal fraternity won't really care how they make their money as such. And uh, the, I guess, was it something else that they could perhaps switch their attention over to? Anything that's illegal, basically. That's right. I mean, you know, we see we we see this today, you know, that I mean, you know, the biggest all the harms or I would say 99 percent of the harms around cannabis are to do with the fact that it's prohibited and they're to do with the criminal activity around it. And the harder you crack down on something, the harder you try to stamp something out, the more the price goes up and the more the price goes up, the keener criminals are to be involved and then the harder you press down again, the more unscrupulous they become about the methods they'll use, violence becomes involved, you crack down harder again, they get more violent, the price goes up higher, it's just a terrible destructive cycle. Now you mentioned the, uh, we've mentioned hemp twice actually and I've looked, I've had lots of hemp products, in fact if you go online and look, you'd be amazed at the number of things that you can eat and wear and do all sorts of things with uh, with regard to hemp. And it really does seem like it's a bit of a, a super plant, you know, almost something that, you know, the, the creation put there for us just to say, here you go. This, this, this will provide you with almost everything you need to survive. And I've often been suspicious about the motivations behind the, the blurring of the, the cannabis and, and the hemp uh, lines such that in, in the US, anyway, I'm not quite sure what the, the status is here, but in the US, I mean, I, I don't believe you can even grow hemp. Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's this preposterous situation. It seems that there's a, there, there, that if hemp was just fully legitimized and fully exploited uh, for the great sort of crop that it is worldwide, that a lot of benefits could come from that. Absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the, perhaps the, the, the fact that, that most succinctly demonstrates the idiocy of, of hemp prohibition is that when um, uh, before the Second World War, uh, cannabis and, and hemp had, had been banned in, in the in, in America, um, but with the outbreak of war, they actually completely reversed the position and made it compulsory for farmers in America to grow a certain amount of hemp because it was essential to the war effort. You know, it it, is, it does have it is the strongest natural fibre in nature. In fact, one of the problems with hemp, and it's not, you know, there's so much nonsense talked about it as well. You know, there's, there's far too many hemp is going to save the world, uh, cra crazy ideas, because one of the great problems with hemp is that it is so strong that it destroys conventional farming machinery. Uh, you need specialist equipment to harvest it. Um, and then in addition to that, and really the thing that really holds back hemp as a crop is the farmer needs somewhere to sell it. And in Britain, there's only one place to sell it, and that's uh, an, an organisation called Hemp Technology, who are based near Ipswich in Suffolk. Um, and, it, and you know, as transport is such a huge component of, of the cost, you know, if you live more than 100 miles away from Ipswich, say 200 at the most, then I mean, it just doesn't make any viable sense. And there isn't there isn't a market for hemp until such times we have more hemp processing plants. Um, so much as hemp does offer an awful lot of benefits, and as you correctly say, you know, there are a huge, huge number of uh, potential uses for it. Until such time as we get more hemp processing plants, farmers are going to choose what crop puts food on their table.